So great to see such a beautiful crowd gathering to honor and commemorate the legacy of the Lubavitcher Rebbe of righteous memory. My name is Rabbi Meir Hecht. On behalf of JLI Chicago, my wife, Yehudis Hecht, our partners, Rabbi Ari and Mindy Goodman, I want to thank the many Chabad centers in Illinois who are co-hosting this special event tonight and special welcome to all of the rabbis and rebbitzins, directors of these organizations. Lubavitch Chabad of Illinois, Chabad of Evanston, Beis Menachem, Chabad of Northbrook, Chabad of Elgin, Chabad of Vernon Hills, Chabad of South Loop, free of Chicago and free of the northern suburbs, Friendship Circle of Illinois, Chabad of Glencoe, Chabad of Wilmette, Chabad of Arlington Heights, Chabad of Norwood Park, the Lubavitch Masifta of Chicago, Chabad of Bucktown, Chabad Kears, Chabad of River North and Fulton Place, Chabad of Oak Park, Chabad of East Rogers Park, Chabad at UIC, Chabad of Skokie, Chabad of Highland Park, the Central Avenue Synagogue, Chabad of Deerfield, Chabad of Gurnee, and Chabad of Lincoln Park. Welcome, everyone. Friends, this week, Thursday, we commemorate the 26th yard site of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, a special day of reflection and inspiration. The Rebbe believed in the intrinsic value of every single human being, and he imparted that belief to every person he encountered. The Rebbe's positive global impact and leadership reaches every corner of the world in an unprecedented way, likely something that has never been seen before in history. Today, 26 years after his passing, his army of thousands of shluchim and tens of thousands of chassidim carry his message of love, goodness, and kindness to the millions of people the world over. But more importantly, the Rebbe's message to all of mankind was that each and every individual is endowed with a God-given mission to transform the world for the good to grow the fruits in God's garden and reveal the divine spark which is inherent in every person and in every created being. To begin tonight's event, we will watch a brief one-minute talk of the Rebbe in the original Yiddish. Don't worry, there's English subtitles, followed by Mrs. Mindy Goodman from JLI, who will introduce tonight's guest speaker. Weltmen erschrocken, was tut sich das in der Welt? Und was mit der Leder und mit Schoner und Schoner ist ach scher dore bit mir. Und mir gibt sich ein Kuchen nieder, heile Katevis, Geber und nieder Seder, wird als Starker und nicht geduscht, wer ruch nie ist. Is Meshel Veshelet nor Lechere Lehepe. Ados is a yinne von a yar, was dort in the gewaltig in Chayis Reus. The Rebbe's mission was to call the world's bluff and reach right in and invert its reality and expose the core, expose the goodness. And he did that on every level to the world entire, to each person he touched. Wir sollen wissen sein, dass wir in einer teuren Welt Das ist eine Welt, die sie ist gegangen. Und nichts ist dann so, dass es nicht so ist, nur dass es gegangen ist von diesen Pärs. Das ist eine Sache in der Welt, wo der Rebester sagt, dass es ein Paar ist, wo das ein Paar ist. Guten Abend, alle. It's a pleasure to be here tonight, so thank you all for joining us. It is an honor and a privilege to introduce to you Rabbi Dove Greenberg, who is the Executive Director of the Chabad Student Center at Stanford University in Palo Alto, California. Rabbi Dove is a Hasidic teacher and an international lecturer with a large following of people who appreciate his unique ability for condensing deep mystical concepts in Judaism into relevant sound bites that truly resonate and inspire. And on a personal note, um, not only is Rabbi Dove one of my favorite rabbis, but he also happens to be my dear brother. So it is an honor to have him join us here tonight. 
please welcome Rabbi Dove Greenberg. Okay, good evening to everybody, my dear friends in uh, Chicago. So tonight we will uh, speak a little bit about two words that have the power to change life in a positive way. So I know that is an audacious claim, but what I want to try to do is illustrate as we go along how these words have power to change our life and to illustrate how this was one of the animating forces in the Lubavitcher Rebbe's success. He used some of these themes and some of the teachings we'll discuss are his teachings about how to apply these words so that they change a person's life with effort. And I'll begin with a story, a little episode that happened that kind of captures it, the two words. And that was a student came into our Jewish center at Stanford University some time ago. And this student looked like he had all of life's blessings. There are times when you look at a person and you say, wow, they have perfect life. And this student was, came from a beautiful family and had talents and gifts and so forth. But after a few months, he said, Rabbi, we need to meet, have a crisis. And as we were discussing things, he says, I'm going through a very difficult time. I have many, many problems in my life, big challenges. So he starts to enumerate. He says, I'm not blessed. I am not talented. I'm not a good Jew. I'm not liked, a whole list. So I basically cut him off. I said, you don't have many problems. You have one problem. And the problem is the words that come after I am. He was saying, I'm not blessed. I'm not smart. I'm not a good Jew. After the I am, he was putting negative words, negative thoughts. He was placing ideas that cause difficulty and challenge in a person's life. Now the thing is the word that we place after I am affects our life and changes who we are in many, many ways. What, so the question is when we wake up in the morning, if we would define ourselves, I am, what word would we put after I am? It's a very serious question because the word we put there often, much more than we realize will actually define our life. Are we putting positive things or negative things? And let me illustrate from two different powerful ways how true this is, and then show in, in Torah and our tradition how this is reflected. First with a powerful story, and it has the added benefit of being true. So for literally over 2000 years, we have records of the fastest a human being was able to run a mile. And a human being was never able to break a four minute mile ever in recorded history. And people argued why that was. Some people felt it was the human bone structure where we're structured in a way that causes too much wind resistance. Others felt it was the lung capacity, human lungs are too small. In 1954, a medical student named Roger Bannister woke up and he said, I am capable of breaking the four minute mile. And he trained and he broke the world's record. And it was on the front pages of all the newspapers. 1954, Roger Bannister broke the four minute mile. He broke it by one second. And what's extraordinary about the story is within a year of Bannister breaking the four minute mile, there was another big race and 37 runners all shattered that barrier four minute mile, they all broke it. A year later, there was another big race, 300 runners all broke the mile. So what changed within a few months, within a year, hundreds of runners started to all break the mile. For 2000 years prior, no one did. What happened? Did human lung capacity change? Did human bone structure change? Of course not. The only thing that changed was human perception of what is humanly possible. 
That's what changed. The moment Bannister broke the barrier, hundreds of runners woke up in the morning and said, I am capable of breaking the mile. And because they woke up with the mindset that if I train harder, I am capable of doing it, they did it. So that is illustration one of how powerful the mind is and the word we put in after I am. If you, for 2,000 years, every runner who was trying to run fast broke up and said, I am not capable of breaking a barrier. And guess what? They weren't. But the moment people started to shift their mindset and say, I am capable, everything changed. So the mind literally has a power to unleash resources, capacities, strengths that we have that either we don't tap into because we limit it from the mind or the mind starts to think differently. The mind starts to think positively. I am capable. When the mind thinks that, things change. Now, here's a study they did at one of the universities on the East Coast. Psychology. Fascinating principle, not from athletics, but from the mind itself. They had many volunteers come into a makeup artist. And the makeup artist painted on their face a big scar. It was conspicuous and ugly and very large, all on the side of their face. And they told these people, each fellow was separate, go to a social setting, speak to people for a few hours, come back at the end and tell us what difference this scar made to your conversations and interactions with people. So they did this with dozens of people with one interesting catch. Right before the volunteer was going out to meet people and discuss things, the makeup artist said, I need to touch something up and they erased the entire scar. But the volunteer did not know that they didn't have the scar. They thought they had the scar. And they came back and you read what they all wrote they spoke about how awkward their conversations were. People were afraid to make eye contact. People weren't treating me like a normal human being and we couldn't speak and this never happened before. So you have a reality that only existed in their mind. They were regular, they were all normal, regular people. In their mind, they decided that they look frightening, horrible, didn't exist. And because in their mind, they perceived themselves as having some kind of scar. So it really affected their conversations and their reality completely changed. So you wake up in the morning, you say, I am not capable of breaking a certain barrier, or I am this type of person and therefore the world and people treat me a certain way, that becomes our reality. So the mind has that power. And the question is, what do we put after the words I am? And now look how this is beautifully and concisely expressed in a story that we're all familiar with in the Torah, in the Bible. But it's easy to overlook if you don't see the two Hebrew words. So I'll share the two Hebrew words. God encounters Moses. We're all familiar. The famous episode by the burning bush. And he tells Moses, the Jewish people are enslaved and they're suffering. And now it's time to redeem the Jews from Egypt. We're going to take them to the promised land. I want you to go to Pharaoh. And I want you to take on this powerful empire and redeem all the Hebrew slaves. What does Moses say? Moses says, in Hebrew, his first response to God is, me, me. Anochi, me Anochi. In English, it means I am nobody. I am me Anochi. I am nobody. He tells God, I'm nobody. I can't do this. You want me to change the world to help so many human beings? Me Anochi. I am nobody. I'm nobody. And then he says, Anochi alal svasayim. I am incapable of eloquent speech. Anochi alal svasayim. I am incapable of eloquent speech. I can't do this mission. You want me to be your spoken? So Moses, this great prophet, 
greatest of the Jewish leaders, initially tells God, I cannot do this mission you send me on. The task is much greater than my capacities. And why? Because Moses was putting after his I am's nobody. I am nobody. I am incapable of delivering God's message. So how does God respond? God doesn't tell Moses, Moses, no, you're not a Ralph Vasayim. No, you're not. You're eloquent. God doesn't say that to Moses. He says, Moses, he says, Moses, of course I know you have, you're not perfect. I created you. I know you don't have the most eloquent way of speaking. But what God tells Moses is, I'm not sending you into this world to face these challenges that you're going to face alone. I am sending you as my ambassador and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be with you. I'm going to give you the strength to do what you need to do. Of course, you're going to be successful. You're going to use the capacities you have. I'm going to be with you. I don't send you alone. I'm going to be with you as you journey through life to do that which you need to do. And you're my ambassador. And in Hebrew, what God tells Moses is the reverse. He reverses the I am's. Moses says, me, Anoichi, I am nobody. God tells him, you have to view yourself differently. I am God's ambassador. I am, God tells Moses to say, I am God's ambassador. You're my ambassador. So of course you can go to Pharaoh. When Moses accepts that, and he starts to view himself as I am God's ambassador, he's able to bring down that evil empire and redeem the Jewish people. And ultimately, we're here today because of that. So Moses shifts his perspective of who he is, of what comes after his I am. It doesn't mean we don't have setbacks in life. It doesn't mean we don't encounter difficulties. Moses had those. It doesn't mean we don't have scars in life. Everybody does. But it means we're going to think positively. We're going to be very careful to put after the words, I am wonderful things, positive thoughts. In many ways, we're all like Moses. We all are sent into the world to bring blessing and redemption and goodness and love to people around us. And everybody can influence people around them, their house, their environment. It's true we all have we're real good excuses. God knows that. But what God says is, after I am, say, I am God's ambassador. So don't give me a whole list of I have this problem and I am this. We can break barriers. We can accomplish great things. The screen just changed. So I just want to make sure. Can you still hear me? Uh, somebody give me a signal. You're good. Okay, good. We'll go on then. Uh, fine. So now it's very interesting. We... Uh, the rabbi mentioned the Lubavitcher Rebbe before. The, the, the Lubavitcher Rebbe has um, a, a set of, really the letters that he sent over 50 years to different kinds of people. Jew, non-Jew, scholar, truck driver, Nobel laureate, movie star, farmer, old, young, child, Letters, correspondence. So they printed up many of them. And it's 30 volumes, over 30 volumes of printed. So I once looked up, I wanted to see how they ever responded when people wrote about difficulty, challenges. And so you can see, obviously, the Rebbe addresses different challenges, each in the personal way and the particular challenge. But I noticed that there was one phrase that appears in those letters more than any other phrase. So if you look at all the letters where he's writing to people for advice about challenges they face, there's one phrase that appears in all of those letters more than any other phrase. You know what that phrase is? It's a couple words in Yiddish. But I'll, trans I'll do it in Yiddish and I'll translate. Tracht gut, vet sein gut. Think positively. Tracht gut, think good. Think optimistically. Think positively. Vet sein gut. And it will become so. It will be good. Positive thought. So after addressing their personal issues, whatever the issue was in a personal way, he would always, not always, very often, like I said, more than any other phrase, 
got to have a positive mindset. Figure out the best possible mindset in this circumstance. Because the mindset changes reality. Changes reality. Now, we come to a challenge that we face with this perspective. And that is, if we say, let's be honest, we say, okay, uh, Rabbi, I hear what you're saying. You have to, I am, after I am, we have to have positive words. God's ambassador, I'm capable, I'm blessed. Things are going to be good. And we could achieve things. But how do we apply this on a daily basis when life has a lot of challenges? It's not easy to be happy. And we get to, we have to analyze something that's actually a legitimate question, a real challenge. And that is the human mind. For most of us, not everyone, but for most of us, you wake up in the morning, not necessarily every morning you wake up happy, overjoyed, optimistic. No. Now the problem is the human mind, listen closely to this, the human mind in many ways was not designed to make us happy. It was designed to make us stressed. Why? Because the human mind needs to make sure we survive. And so therefore, it's always looking out for possibilities of what could go wrong, what's dangerous, what disaster could hit me today? What do I have to be careful? So if you have a brain that a big part of it is designed to always scan for possible lurking dangers behind the shadows, so it either could fight or flight, that's the instinctive reaction, it's hard to be happy if you wake up in the morning and you're thinking about the thousand things that can go wrong. That's the way the, body, the mind operates. I mean, a simple illustration. Each of us had the experience to hear a, a, a sudden thud or a loud noise when you were, were not expecting it and you jumped, right? You had that experience, you jumped, you're afraid. Something negative is happening, right? Literally, it's fight, flight. Did it ever once happen in, in your life? You heard a big noise and you thought, oh, maybe somebody dropped the treasure through the window. Maybe somebody threw a sack of gold through the bedroom window. It never happened once. Why? Why? Not once. Why? Because the mind doesn't think that way. The mind doesn't go to some optimistic, positive thought when you hear a loud crash. The immediate goes to, there's a terrorist attack, a plane's flying through the building. That's the mind. So what do you, how do we deal with that? <laughs> it reminds me that was once it's a good Jewish tale to show you how this affects the the Jewish people. Uh, there was a, a young Jew in, in New York on the subway platform Friday, Shabbat's coming. Things were running late and he needed to know what time it was because Shabbat was coming and he doesn't travel on Shabbat. And he sees another Jew wearing a kippah and he rushes over and says, what time is it? Guy ignores him. He says it in Hebrew, Masha'ah, what time? Ignore him. In Yiddish, ignore him. He says, I don't understand. Why you ignore me? It's Shabbat. We're two Jews. We got to know the time. We're rushing to make it home for Shabbat. Why, don't you, why do you ignore me? What kind of person are you? So the, oh, the guy looks at this young uh, teenager. He says, I'll tell you why I'm annoyed. Really. Very simple. He says, if I answer you, your question, we're going to start up a conversation. We're going to be talking and schmoozing on the train, on the subway. You're going to sit next to me. Shabbat's like in like 25 minutes. I'm going to feel compelled because of my Jewish guilt to invite you to my home. You're not going to make it to your house on time. You're going to accept the invitation. You're going to come for the Friday night dinner. And you're going to sit next to my daughter. She's about your age. Very special, beautiful, wonderful. You're going to sit. You're going to talk the whole night. You're going to schmooze and this. And then you're going to fall in love. And then you're going to want to get married. He says, tell me, why do I want a son-in-law that can't afford a watch? So that's a good, that's called Jewish positive thinking, right? You're thinking, what could possibly go wrong? Because somebody's going to come. Oh, he's a son-in-law that can't afford it. But that's a funny way of saying the human mind often, in a, in a, maybe in a great bashert moment, in a great possible moment, is thinking, what could go wrong, you know, in 10 years from now, how could this lead <laughs> to a problem? Ah, so now listen, my friends, very closely. Judaism is well aware of this struggle, this challenge, and it has beautiful ways to deal with it. And I'll share one, and it's astonishing, the language. What is the first words Jewish tradition tells us to meditate and think about in the morning. The first words, the moment one gains consciousness. Before you get out of your bed, before you even wash the hands or take a shower, 
Judaism says the first words, the second you wake up, you're still on your bed. First thing you should say is, thank you, God, for giving me my soul. The Hebrew words are this. Listen closely to the first two Hebrew words. Moda ani lefanecha. Moda ani. I am grateful. Moda ani. I am grateful. First words our tradition says that we should think about, that we should download into our brain, is I am grateful. I'm positive. Think positive. Think about all the blessings you have. The prayer goes on to say, Thank you, God. I am grateful for another day, for life, for health, for the blessings that surround me. And then we go into a whole beautiful list of many, many blessings. Thanking God for the beautiful sunrise, for the health the sights we see, the food we eat, the clothes we wear, a list of all positive. But Judaism, in other words, is telling us, yes, there's certain hardware in the mind that will always search for the negative, but it doesn't mean we're prisoner to being negative people and not feeling life with joy and gratitude. You see, half the blessings, three quarters of the blessings, not most of the blessings we already have, they're surrounding us, they're all over the place but we didn't stop to realize. So Judaism says, stop looking in every blessing and finding a, something to catch about. Download in the morning, the first thing, I am. After your I am, you have to have the words grateful. So that's a perspective Judaism wants us to have. Yes, there are challenges in life, but figure out, start with gratitude. Gratitude, you have a happier life. We all know a child is grateful, they're happy. If you spoil a child, they think uh, everything's coming to them. They can't be happy. That's the story of uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. In short, that's what happens. So we got to be positive. I saw, <laughs> I saw this, a wise chassid in uh, 770, the Babich World Headquarters years ago. So I was a teenager. We were sitting late at night. There was a beautiful Hasidic gathering and singing and melodies. It's probably two, three in the morning. And a fellow, people knew him. He was an older Jew. He was 90 years old. He walks through and he wants to, he wanted to join the particular group, this bench. And he put his hands over the bench and he like kind of leaped over and landed very agilely like an athlete. So people were impressed. He was 90 years old and he's jumping over benches three in the morning. Impressive. So one guy looks at him. He says, you know, you're in Yiddish. He says, you're not the kaka. That means you're like some old fogey. You're an old person. You're 90. How you're a 90 year old guy. How do you jump over a bench? How do you do this? You're 90 years old. You're old. So the guy with the twinkle in his eye says, I'm not, I'm not 90 years old. I'm not an old man of 90. He says, I'm three young men of 30. <laughs> okay. It's a different person. If you wake up in the morning and say, I'm old, I'm weak. I can't. Guess what? You're going to be right. <laughs> You're going to be right. But if you wake up in the morning, you say, I'm three younger men of 30. And obviously you work to make sure that's so. I'm grateful for the blessing. And I'm your ambassador. And there's a lot of work to do. We still have a journey. We have a mission. So I might have some scars. I might, uh, but we're going to, I might have barriers. People might have said, you can't do this. You, you, you have this problem. You have, uh, you know, you, you had, did certain bad things in your life. You have certain addictions. You're stuck. You're trapped. You're confined. No, I could break any barrier. I'm an ambassador to God. I have another day of life. I'm grateful. Now I'm going to start breaking barriers. I'm not going to. I'm three young men of 30. So the perspective changes it all, shifts it all. What works? What words do we put after I am? Massive difference, changes everything. Now, I want to tell you about a book, a beautiful book written by one of the best-selling Jewish authors of our, of, the, of our time, Joseph Telushkin. Joseph Telushkin wrote many books on Jewish wisdom, Jewish humor. He wrote a book a few years ago called Rebbe, a biography of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. He has a chapter in there about the Rebbe's optimism. The Rebbe was optimism always looking at things in a positive way. So in this chapter about optimism, and parenthetically, he writes there, the Rebbe wasn't some kind of blind optimist pretending the world wasn't the way it was. He, Tulushkin writes, the Rebbe was very aware of all the challenges in the world. He had many of his students and people who were close to him who informed him about the difficult realities and situations people were in. Very much, but he was 
very optimistic. So Tolushkin has a chapter on that. And what was striking to me in the chapter, Tolushkin, the author, focuses on the Rebbe's optimism and how he was very careful to only use optimistic language. And Tolushkin then goes on to analyze the power of the optimistic language. And I'll share one or two examples from Tolushkin's book. You see how language, even language, shifts the way we feel. Language is very powerful. I mean, Tolushkin doesn't say this in the book, but just to illustrate quickly how powerful language is. Uh, if somebody, you know, you see somebody get smacked in the face, God forbid, their face turns red, right? Or if they get punched in the stomach, there's a biological reaction. If somebody's insulted in public, embarrass somebody, they have the same biological reaction. Their face turns red, their heart rate changes, they sweat. Somebody's embarrassed. Words are just with words. Words are very powerful. They check us physiologically, even as if something physical does. So words are very powerful. Somebody uses positive words about others or themselves, it affects a person. It's not some kind of hocus pocus new age thought. Is it physical, a smack and a punch affects somebody? Words have the same effect. Words are very powerful. So Tulushkin talks about one, he says, in Hebrew, the phrase is, well, you refer to a hospital as bet cholim, a house of the sick. Somebody says, oh, where are you? Oh, I'm in the hospital, I'm in the house of the sick. I'm sick, I'm in the house of the sick. So the Rebbe wrote to doctors in the 60s. In Israel, he said, you guys should, uh, uh, the hospitals in Israel shouldn't called, be called Bet Cholim, the house of the sick. They should be called Bet Rifua, the house or the home of healing, of recovery. That's what it's about. It's not about getting sick. It's about recovery. And, he, and, and the Rebbe made this point to doctors in person and in, and, and in letters. In other words, it's, it makes a difference to a person if they're in a place and say, I'm in a place. I'm a home of recovery. It's about recovery. I am recovering. I am in a home of versus I am, <laughs> I am where? I am in a house of sick. The words have an impact. The, and this you can see live. Uh, you, there was a group who came from Israel to visit the Rebbe once. And this group was a special group. Um, they came, they were all wounded in the 1973 war. And Israel is fought for its life and won, thank God. But many soldiers were hurt horrifically missing limbs and the most great heroes, but they were, they made the ultimate sacrifice to save Eretz Yisrael, the Holy Land and protect Jews. So many of them who came, they were called the Nichei Tzahal, the wounded of Tzahal, of the Israeli Defense Force, the wounded or the handicapped. That's how you translate the Nichei Tzahal, the handicapped of the Israeli Defense Force. So you see 770, many of people in wheelchairs with deformities, missing limbs, and so forth. So the Rebbe began his talk by saying that the, we shouldn't refer to this room, to these people, as a handicapped of, of, of the Israeli army. No, no, what you guys are? Mitsuyan Tzahal. You are the exceptional of the Israeli army. You're the exceptional of Israel. You're the heroic. Why are you called Niche? You should call Mitsuyan So another, and and, you, and 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 then Deborah went on to speak about in that talk with them, because you can hear it, it was recorded, you can see the video. He wanted to say, yes, there's challenges in life and you are great heroes. And of course, there's tremendous challenge, but certainly God also gives you great capacity in other areas to accomplish great things. Showing them a perspective to be optimistic, to go forward and not thinking, oh, my life is over. No, there's new capacities, new blessings that one could, Unleash and harness. But think about that. A bunch of soldiers coming in and their title was the handicapped of Israel and they leave with the title I am Mitsuyani, the exceptional. I am handicapped. I am exceptional. That's a big impact. So what words are we thinking about in the morning? How do we describe ourselves? How do we describe others? How do we deal with, yes, challenges in our world, but Modani, I am grateful. What barriers are holding us back that don't need to? If we change our minds, things change. And this brings us to, I want to save a few minutes for some questions. Um, so I'll, I'll finish with two points. I'll finish with, 
in this Torah section, we just, in the Torah section, we just read, Moses sends 12 spies to Israel to check out the land. Because God's the promised land. So come back and give us a report how we can enter the land, how we can conquer it, how we could fulfill our mission. Ten of them come back and say, we can go into the land. It's too difficult. We will be destroyed. The land is horrible. There's no way we can do this. A negative report with many verses of all negative. All were incapable. They even say the people are so strong there. We are grasshoppers. That's what they say. Compared to their strength, we are grasshoppers. So after I am, they were putting grasshopper. I am a grasshopper. A grasshopper complex. Grasshoppers. So their I am's, the 10 of the 12 spies, all negative. Two of them came back, Yeshua and Kalev, two of the spies, and they had all positive things. The same reality, they both viewed a land they both groups viewed the challenges. One, all negative after the I am's, and Kolev and Yeshua came back with all positives. The land is filled with power, with great fruit and vegetables. It's a wonderful land. We can conquer it. God's with us. We're going we're gonna to be able to elevate it. All positives. After the I am's, they filled it with all positives. Now, like often happens, the negative report um, was much more popular than the positive reports. Right? If it bleeds, it leads. This goes back to the Bible. All the Jews started to cry. Oh, we can't do it. They all started to be dispirited and they lost the optimism. The good news, the optimistic, the good perspective, was buried under an avalanche of negative news. Now, what is extraordinary is God's response. I'll say it in Hebrew. Listen closely. It brings everything we've been talking about tonight Beautiful, concise, biblical words. Listen to how beautifully the Torah puts it, how God responds to the two reports. God responds through Moses to give a message to the, to the 10 spies and the two spies, and then by extension to all the Jews. He says this, Ka'asher dibartem, as you spoke, came es, so will be. As you spoke, so to the 10 spies who say, we can't get to the promised land, you're right. You won't make it. You can't make it. You're right. Kasher Bartim, as you spoke, Kainasa, so will be. But Yeshua and Kalev who said, we can make it and it's going to be successful. And we're going to be able to get to the promised land. Kasher Bartim, as you spoke, Kainasa, so it will be. As we speak, as we perceive, so it is. If one says, I cannot fulfill the divine mission God gives me. I need to get to a promised land. We all are on a journey. We all have a promised land to get to, to a place where our souls are meant to be, where we're using our capacities, our resources, our influences, our nishama, our mitzvah. We all have a sphere of influence that only we could affect. We all have a promised land only we could create, but, and it's a journey. But if one says, I can't make it like the 10 spies, we can't do it. As we speak, as we think, so, so it is. But if we take on Yahushua and Kalev perspective and we say, yes, there are challenges, but we are going to surmount them. And we will use the resources of this land to build wonderful and great things, then Kainessa saw it will be. So that, we, we, from the last half hour or so, we chartered together some powerful idea, very simple, very simple. The two, what word do we put after I am changes our life, changes our reality in beautiful and powerful ways. Yes, there will be setbacks, but if we have a positive attitude and we think positively, we know we're on a mission of God and we wake up every morning with that consciousness, then we'll make it to the promised land. We'll know we're ambassadors of God. We'll break barriers. We'll be young people with, with the vitality and the strength we need to achieve our things. Yes, we'll have a setback. We'll get back up with the optimism. We'll move into that space. And to conclude with a final story, because I think this is it's a true story that happened to a woman in New York some years ago, and it really just brings it home in a different language. There was a woman, her name was Zoe Koppelman, a Jewish woman. And for decades, she 
had many physical challenges. She wasn't able to walk properly and many physical challenges. But a few years ago, she decided to run to New York Marathon, 26 miles. Okay. She's with, she had crutches. She's gone. Okay. She came in at the absolute last. Took her 31 hours and 15 minutes. But guess what? The cameras were there. The cameras were there. And she comes at the end. She's schlepping. She really couldn't move. And the cameras ask her, why did you run the marathon? What are you doing? Are you crazy? And she responded in a very beautiful way. She said, you know, when a person is born, God gives everybody many blessings. But in her phrase, where she says, we all have a television with a hundred beautiful, vibrant channels with beautiful color and many things, many gifts. God gives everybody many gifts, Zoe said. Everybody has many beautiful channels in life. She says, but everybody also has a channel or two that's not so beautiful. Static challenges, problems, crises from ourselves, family, psychological, physical, many challenges in life. We all have, no one has perfect hundred channels. Everybody has. She said, I have some physical major challenges, static. And I had a choice in my life. I could have decided that I'm going to sit on the couch my whole life and fetch and look at that static. Just look and look, count my, the miseries in my life. And I would be justified to do that. She made, I made a decision decades ago that every single morning I'm going to wake up, I'm going to ch- turn the channel. I'm going to turn it to something vibrant. I'm not going to sit back and sulk. I'm going to change. So I ran the marathon because I changed my channel. That's why I ran. That's what it is to think positive, to change the channel, to wake up and going, Thank you, Hashem. So, friends, we'll take questions, but if we can wake up in the morning practically, a simple mitzvah, if we do it already, get another person to do it. Wake up in the morning and do the prayer. It's so easy to do that. Thank you, God, for giving me. I'm grateful to you. I am grateful to you. I'm thankful to you, God. Another day, you start off your day with a positive mitzvah, with Jewishness, with a prayer and optimism. That's the way to start. And then you take it from there. You wrap tefillin, meditate, you pray. You move out to the day to see what it is. I'm an ambassador from God. It brings us to a very happy life. So with that, we'll open up to some questions if one, that's what you want to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rabbi Greenberg. Those birds chirping in the background, that certainly gives a really flowery taste to your presentation. Thank you, that was amazing. I would like to just uh, make a very special welcome. We have someone with us tonight who uh, is the was the personal doctor of the Rebbe, Dr. Ira Weiss from Skokie, who is with us. Thank you for joining. Maybe when we're done questions, you'll share a word or two. I'll give you a few minutes to think about it while we do the, while we do the questions. So a question came in. And just as a reminder, you can you can message some of the questions to uh, the JLI Chicago uh, or on the the, the group ch- the group ch- the group chat, or you can just raise your hand if you'd like, uh, and we'll try to get a number of questions. So a question came in, Rabbi Greenberg from uh, Sarah, asking, "What does someone do if they have a lot of negativity?" in their environment around them and they feel like it's hard to have a positive outlook on life what do you do then um um yeah you mentioned dr weiss is on so that's a what a special neshama what an incredible doctor that's a thank you for all of your service and incredible things that you've done dr weiss I'll, I'll answer by a memory with Dr. Weiss, and I'll just add a story to it. I remember when I was a teenager, I believe the year was 1990, Simchas Torah 1990 or 91, one of those. Just, it was Simchas Torah, so we were teenagers in 770. What a, a night, incredible night. Thousands and thousands of people, no social distancing. <laughs> there was no space. You, the room was so crowded that if you would lift up your foot feet you wouldn't fall to the floor that was the and dr white now years before that the rebbe had a very massive heart attack during one of these evenings of a simchas torah service in 1990 the rebbe was already like 90s year about 90 91 that and dr weiss was in the crowd then i don't know i'm just uh, I, i'm just guessing here i'm just guessing but I, dr weiss was 
you know, some feet away from the Rebbe. And I imagine he was a bit as a wonderful top doctor and physician, cardiologist. I imagine he was a little bit concerned uh, for the Rebbe's health, of course. Uh, you know, and, and uh, but I remember this. I remember at a certain point during the Hakafot, during the dancing and the celebration, the Rebbe turned to Dr. Weiss and made the emotions of a tethoscope. Uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure the doctor probably was carrying one and it kind of went like this. And I remember I was a teenager, so I, I understood the symbolism. And then the Rebbe went like this, symbol, like went to like this, like it's, we're good, not necessary. With a, and I remember, uh, the, I, I was a teenager. I looked at Dr. Weiss. I remember he had a great joyous, there was a look of joy on his face of optimism that it's all, it's, it's good, things are going to be well. But, uh, but I imagine that there was good reason. I don't know the medical, but I, I imagine there was good reason to be concerned, but then to find within a situation, a beautiful and positive way to go about it. But I want to add to that. I remember that vividly, um, but I want to add to that one story to address that the Sarah's question a bit sharper. It's a lovely story of the Rebbe Rashab. He was named as Shalom Dovber. And he was a great scholar in the Chabad Rebbe in Russia last century. And for months, he was away from the city where all the big community, the Jewish community was. He was away for whatever reason it was, I'm not sure, but he was in a different place. And he was away from most of the Jewish community, but certainly away from the Hasidim and all of that. Now, uh, a student, a chassid, came to where he was, and they met, and they discussed things. And this chassid what came from the city of Kharkov, Kharkov, Russia, Ukraine. The borders changed. <laughs> There's often land, land grabs over there in that region. But Kharkov, a chassid came from Kharkov, and Kharkov was a big city of many involved Jews and a big Chabad community. So the Rebbe Rashab, the Chabad Rebbe, tells him, oh, Vos Herzach in Kharkov. How are things going over there in Kharkov? Give him a report about Kharkov. So the Chassid says, oh, Kharkov? Want to know about Kharkov? I'll tell you. The synagogues, they pray beautifully with real heartfelt intent. It's a prayer. Any synagogue in Kharkov, beautiful prayer. People are studying Torah. You go into the houses of study. You go into the schools. High-level education. People are really studying, and it's a affecting their character. You have real intellect and real beautiful character behavior from the study in heart. So then you go into the, the schools where they teach about kindness and love and help. Beautiful, a lot of tzedakah, a lot of kindness and graciousness. Kharkov is like just spectacular, filled with holiness and love and morality. So the Rebbe was overjoyed and he gave him a golden coin. He said, here's a appreciate, token of appreciation. He gave him a golden ruble, golden coin, fine. Two hours later, another chassid came from Kharkov. And he also had a conversation with the Rebbe. And the Rebbe says, oh, you're from Kharkov. Vos in Kharkov. How are things over there in Kharkov? So the chassid said, in Kharkov, I'll tell you the truth, Rebbe. I'll tell you the truth. The synagogues, the prayer is not good, unimpressive. The people are praying, but they mumble words. It's not the real thing. Study, eh, they're not studying Torah so much. And people are narcissists. They're all about more wealth, more power, more fame, not a lot of kindness. So the whole city needs a revamp. It's uh, unimpressive. The prayer is not so good. It all, so the Rebbe said, okay, I appreciate your report. Thanks for giving it to me. And the, the conversation ended. An hour after that, both disciples from Kharkov met. And they said, oh, I spoke to the Rebbe. I also spoke to them. Now, <laughs> The one who gave the bad report found out that his friend gave a good report and got a golden coin and he didn't get anything. So he was very upset. He went running back to the Rebbe. The Rebbe said, yes, what can I do for you? He says, Rebbe, I have a, I have a complaint against you. So the Rebbe says, okay, well, what's bothering you? He says, my colleague came in two hours earlier. He told you everything's beautiful, wonderful prayer. You gave him a gold coin. He says, I, told, I, didn't, I didn't tell you flattery, fake news. I told you the real truth. I gave you a real correct analysis. And you don't give me any gold coin? No, why? Well, strange. So the Rebbe looked at him with a smile. The Rebbe tells, told him like this. And sorry, this gets to your question. The Rebbe tells him, you think I don't know what's going on in Kharkov? The Rebbe says, I know very well what's going on in Kharkov. What I wanted to know is, in what Kharkov do you live? In what Kharkov do you live? And that is always true in life. Wherever we are, there's always two Kharkovs, any community, any home. There's always a way 
to view it in one way and then that way becomes true. But the question is, we have to decide wherever we are to live in a beautiful Kharkov. If we decide to live in a beautiful and then we act to cultivate and nurture and develop it, then so it becomes. So that's, I don't know the specifics of the question, but that's a general thing that in Kharkov, there's always, every Kharkov, there's always two Kharkovs. In every community, in every home, there's always two. And then it's largely our perspective. All right, thank you. A question came in. How would you share the mindset of Moda Ani with someone who is largely secular to Jewish education and not familiar, doesn't have background with, uh, with prayer, the Jewish prayers, and uh, to utilize the idea of Moda Ani for a positive mindset? Yeah, that's a beautiful question. I mean, but that would be, imagine you have uh, somebody who lives in a place that they don't know of exercise, that it's healthy, and they don't have, oh, they only have junk food. I know that sounds like a shtetl, but <laughs> I mean, imagine you have a, somebody who, and then you tell them, oh, this is a much better way to live much healthier, for body, mind, and soul. And uh, so you say some a Jew who's secular, much e in, in many ways is much easier. We have to share with our brothers and sisters, with, with, with the Jewish community, also with the non-Jewish community. The first thought a person should have is positive thoughts. Wake up in the morning, say the prayer, open up any prayer book, go online, Chabad.org. First prayer in any traditional prayer book for hundreds and hundreds of years. I am grateful. You say it in English, you talk to God. God speaks all languages. You say, God, I'm grateful. Thank you for giving me another day of life. That's the prayer. You can look for the exact words you want to add. You can say more prayers. You can do one page, two page. If you're secular, don't do too many pages. Don't get afraid. But to pray, everybody, to wake up in the morning and to download positive thoughts is not some ritual that is some kind of strange, exotic thing. It's, this is for human health, it's for healthy, beautiful living. For every human being, anybody who has an image, of anybody, any human being made in the image of God, which is every human being, should do it. Certainly a Jew should do it. That's the Jewish tradition. It's a special mitzvah. So simply to do it, you can do it in Hebrew or in English. Language is not relevant. The main thing is that we're downloading gratitude and thanking God. And then, so that's a beautiful way to start. I'll say, because you asked one more thing. Years ago, I read in an article, it was in the New York Times or in the Wall Street Journal. Somebody had an article called, the a psychologist wrote it. And they said the first thought of the day, they called it the, the rudder of the day. A boat or a ship has a rudder. It's a small little apparatus at the back of the ship. It's very small. And if you turn it slightly, it changes the destination of your whole ship. If you're on a cruise and you go this. So a little shift, you have, can have thousands of horsepower, many people on the ship, but the rudder shifts everything. So this psychologist said that the first thought you think of the day is the rudder of the day. It shifts the whole perspective, somehow the first moments of the day impact the whole day. This writer wasn't Jewish and wasn't writing about Moidani. But I remember when I read the article, I thought, ah, oh, Judaism wants the rudder of the day to be very positive. Psychologically, the, he was making the argument, and I think he's correct, that the opening moments are very, very powerful. So that's the, uh, the answer is that it's for all Jewish people. You don't have to be religious. <laughs> you have to be Jewish with the soul. We all have and all human beings. Wake up and thank God. Download positivity. You'll see it will affect your roommate and everybody in your house also right away, very, very quickly. Thank you. So two, two different questions came in. They're not the same question, but I'm going to ask both of them because I think you may be able to tie them together in your response. So one question that came in is that we know that the Talmud says that the whole world was created. We, we have to see the world as if it was created for me, for the individual. And then on the other side, we're supposed to look at ourselves as dust and ashes and not to be pompous and all about myself. How do we balance those two views? And the, the other question, which is kind of very different. Well, it's, like, it's very simple. Dust and ashes is for somebody else. And for me, the world was created. Okay. That's <laughs> simple. Yeah, yeah. It wraps it up. So, okay, we're done with that one. Uh, yeah. I'll take that. All right. So how about uh, the... When, in, when we're talking about positive thinking, sometimes people sort of abuse positive thinking or use it in yes. the wrong way where yes. they'll say their positive thinking is going to drive them to who knows where, for example, to take, them to take them to Las Vegas to gamble all their life savings yeah. for positive thinking. Yeah. How yeah. do you balance that? Yeah, okay. So 
the the um yeah oh they actually do connect the questions i was wondering how you saw a connection in the two questions but okay the the trick in life is you're right there are two verses one talks about the whole world the talmud says person should say the whole world was created for me that's how important i am then there's another verse that talks about the person should view themselves as i'm just ash i'm simple i'm dust and ashes i'm nothing i'm insignificant so one of the Hasidic masters answered beautifully. He said, you have to have each one of these verses in a different pocket. In one pocket, on your right side, you put one verse that says, the whole world was created for me. On the left side, you put, I'm dust and ashes. He says, know what the trick in life is? Know what, know what the, a big trick in life is? You have to know when to pull out what verse. It's very easy to confuse it. Sometimes you're walking in a synagogue and you don't get, they don't give you the cheer of honor. They don't give you the top aliyah. You get all angry. How come they don't recognize I'm so special? No, no. Somebody tells you something that's a bit insulting. Then you have to reach into the pocket, say, I'm nothing. It's okay. My ego is not so big. It's fine. But so, but your neighbor needs help. Some person, says, oh, my neighbor is who am I? I can't help my neighbor. I'm dust and ashes. No, no, no. Somebody reaches out to you for help. You say, the whole world was created for me, meaning I could make a difference. I can help. I can bring a helping hand, a loving heart, a mitzvah to this place. I'm not going to say I can't do it. I can make a difference. The whole world was created for me. So it's very important to know. The trick in life is to know what verse to pull out when. And it's a very easy confusion. I think we all confuse it from time to time when our, we, we pull out the wrong verse at the wrong time. So you have to know when to apply something, and that's critical. The same would apply to anything in life, a surgeon, right? What a, a sharp blade in the hand of a surgeon saves incredible amount of life. In the wrong hand or cut in the wrong way, in a callous way, could destroy lives. Words could elevate and destroy. So positive thought always is within the guidelines. To think positive is always within healthy and positive guidelines. Gets into other guidelines of morality, of goodness, of holiness. So obviously, and also biology. So obviously a person can't say, I'm thinking positive, I'm jumping off a roof. That's not thinking positive. That's thinking recklessly, dangerously, and suicide. That's a suicide thought, God forbid. So it always has to be within the realm of, of, of morality, in the realm of possibility, in the realm of goodness. And so it, obviously then the question will get into many other questions. How do we know when to apply it? So for that, hopefully we need to have colleagues and mentors and sometimes objective people. But I will say for most of this stuff, most of the time we all know, for example, most of us know, I'll put it very simply, it's not a challenge to wake up in a bad mood. Okay? It doesn't take any great power. I woke up today, I woke up today, honey, I woke up today in a bad mood. Very good. Many people wake. It doesn't take... Uh, any kind of discipline or heroic effort to wake up in a bad mood. Wake up and then down the positive thought and say it's going to be a great day. That takes effort. That's, that's enviable. So in most of our life, we know that there's challenges to be grateful, to be happy and positive, And we need to work to apply it in many, many ways. So that, I would say, is the majority of it. And then you can have hope, you know, a much smaller area where there would be a gray area. And then you can have the area where obviously if you apply positive thought there, it's a misnomer. It's not positive thought. It's actually dangerous thought. But my, and my other point is that this will apply to everything in life too. Everything that can bring blessing and health and the more powerful it also can bring destruction and we need to know when to use it. Right? So, so the question is a good question, but for most of us, I think it's pretty clear that we need to work every day to, download that perspective and work on it. And then there could be the gray area. And then there's certain areas where it's just unhealthy and destructive to think in that way. A very interesting question came in. And I think if you don't mind, Rabbi, I'm going to direct it to Dr. Ira Weiss. Beautiful. Personal doctor. Maybe he can help us with this question. And then you'll uh, give uh, your, your two cents on this after. So doctor, I'm going to unmute you. Uh, let's see. You're going to have to click on mute. There we go. Okay. Uh, Dr. Weiss. So welcome. Again, thank you for being with us. Question that came in is, ha have you had any specific interaction with the Rebbe that highlighted the ability to focus on, on positivity in your life and for that to be a health benefit? 
not only uh, not only in the in the general psychological arena, but in actual physical health. First of all, before I answer this very nice question, I wanted to thank Rabbi Greenberg for giving us such a wonderful talk, and to Rabbi Hecht for hosting this meeting for all of us. And I'm very honored to join you because I'm not a general member of the community in a sense, but yet I live in the community and I really applaud what Chabad is doing for the whole area of Chicago and the whole world. Rabbi Greenberg's talk was very penetrating. And to answer your question, I'll go back to some of the things that Rabbi Greenberg referred to at the beginning of the talk, which I found prof profoundly relevant to the, answering this question and profoundly relevant to the Rebbe. I just wish all of you could have had the privilege that I shared with my fellow doctors in meeting a person of the Rebbe's stature. And I'll go into that a little bit maybe at the end of the question. So Rabbi Hecht is asking, what can we sometimes, or how can we use the idea of an optimistic approach to elevate health? And I'm going to give you two examples. One of them goes back 100 years, 100 years, 102 years, actually. And one of them is relevant to the time when I took care of the Rebbe in 1977, which is only a mere 43 years ago, or what is it? Is it 43? <laughs> My math may be a little bit off. It may be more than that. But the the idea was that we were called in to help the Rebbe at a time of a grave crisis because the Rebbe had lost so much momentum from his heart getting damaged that he could not even carry on a conversation. His blood pressure was too low to sustain this. And it certainly looked like it was not going to be very likely that the Rebbe would be a Rebbe anymore, even if we could be lucky enough to strike up a bargain with Hashem to bring him through a life of this, in this crisis. And we couldn't share this with the world, obviously. It would obviously destroy any potential there would be becoming a Rebbe. So we had to keep it under our belts and keep it to ourselves. But in addition, we had to be honest with the Rebbe that when we got him through the initial crisis to bring back his blood pressure so he could converse, we then had to deal with the reality of telling the Rebbe what happened so that he could make proper plans. And we told him that probably one half of his cardiac muscle was injured by the blocking of an artery, which is a lot of heart muscle. There may be a few doctors in the crowd who may understand this from their experience, but he was really unable to really generate a good contract contraction of his ventricle anymore, his pumping chamber, because so much of the muscle was, was lost, and in our minds, lost forever. So the Rebbe approached this in two ways. He certainly understood our grave commentary on what had happened to him, and he didn't fall apart. He said two things. He said, could we restore the damaged muscle? And I and other fellow doctors who trained me, some of them who worked with me, all in unison agreed that we weren't planning to restore any of the muscle. They said, this is not a technique useful. And the Rebbe, without missing a beat, retorted immediately. He said, what about using stem cell research to bring back the muscle from fibrous tissue by just causing the fibrous cells to differentiate back into heart muscle cells. Well, he caught us by surprise. It was 1977, and many of us were people who were on the staff of many of the Boston, you know, major medical centers, and we were unable to come up with an answer because we had never heard of stem cell research being applied this way. We barely had heard of stem cell research, and the Reb had already re read medical journals, especially some of the British medical journals, which had talked about an active program and trying to pursue this. So he caught us completely off guard and he was thinking immediately, how do we combat the diagnosis that you've given and restore the heart muscle cells so the heart can now contract with all the muscle cells squeezing in the pumping chamber of the heart. So we, we, we did witness that this came to fruition 10 years later in 1987, the first major work with transforming fiber cells into muscle cells came on the boards but of course, that was well after the fact of the Rebbe's heart attack. So the Rebbe then used the second approach using an optimistic bend. He said, Dr. Weiss, have you ever attended a birthday party? And I said, of course, when I was a child, we had birthday parties all the time. And he said, what did you observe when they blew air into the balloon? He didn't have balloons as a child in Europe. Uh, he really had soap bubbles and he liked to watch soap bubbles. So he had a similar idea. They didn't even have cars then, so they could, he didn't have the experience of inflating a pneumatic automobile tire. So he didn't have balloons or tires, which of course we all take for granted. He had soap bubbles and he watched. As he blew more air into a soap bubble, the soap bubble, of course, expanded. 
And I'll ask all of you the question, what happened to the tension in the wall of the soap bubble as he put more air into the soap bubble? And all of you will know the answer. The soap bubble became more and more stressed and all the little soap molecules, molecules of the item that causes the soap bubble were pulled, pulled, pulled harder apart. The Rebbe then came back with a brilliant answer. He said, Dr. Weiss, what if you have a heart that's as damaged as you say mine is, and you made it expand? Would that be very good for the remaining muscles or not too good for the remaining muscles? And you can all answer this right now from what I just told you. Obviously, if you put an expansion of the heart, if you put more fluid in the heart, the remaining muscles which have, would have a much harder time. It's like saying to yourself, I own a hardware store and I'm going to employ someone who was injured in the war so his arm is weak. And then I have another guy who's got two strong arms. The question is, would you ask the guy with the two strong arms just to load the stuff on the lower shelves and ask the guy with the damaged arm to go put the stuff on the higher shelves? And you all know the answer to that question. Of course, you wouldn't do the latter. The Rebbe said, what if we kept the heart at the smallest possible volume? The remaining muscle fibers would have much less work to do than if it was an expanded heart. And he said that he has, as a student of chemistry, he studied with Nobel winning scientists at the Berlin, at Berlin. He had Schrodinger and Nernst who independently won two different Nobel prizes in physics. He understood that if you were to really consider salt, sodium, as something that retains fluid, it's not uncommon for all of us who've taken care of a grandparent or have someone in the family who's sickly to see how swollen their legs get or whatnot when they eat a high sodium meal. And so he said, maybe I'll put myself on a low sodium diet, even lower than you're gonna tell me, Dr. Weiss, and bring my heart size down because I'm gonna retain much less fluid. So what the Rebbe did was he continued, of course, to keep strict kashrut, but he minimized his intake of food that requires koshering because of the use of salt and the inescapable amount of salt that goes into the meat or item that's being koshered, the poultry that's being koshered. And he, he and his wife, Rebson Schneerson, who likewise was an outstanding person. I just, she was so private. None of you have had a chance to really know about what a wonderful Rebson Schneerson, person Rebson Schneerson was. But the two of them ganged up on me and got together on this low sodium diet that we had not even conceived of. And he brought his heart size down measurably. We had echo technology then. It was just a new technology at that time. But we actually measured his bringing his heart size down. The Rebbe never had congestive heart failure, which would have been, have been an inescapable from a heart attack. And he never would have been a Rebbe as forceful as he was to, in his 15 active years before he had a stroke, to inaugurate the massive program of the Shaluchim and expand it beyond anyone's imagination from what it had started when he had the heart attack. And he left his major imprint just because he personally engineered an optimistic approach of taking lemons and actually really creating an unusual form of lemonade that we had not thought of. So we had to have our heads re-examined as doctors and we learned a lot from the Rebbe and we got to know about the optimism. And the Rebbe also, when I was telling him we can't get this done, we won't be able to get this done, he reminded me, he said, Dr. Weiss, I remember you told me that you are a track man. In fact, you told me you are a sprinter and you are a high hurdler and a low hurdler. He said, did you know about Roger Bannister? And here comes Rabbi Dove Greenberg today to tell us about Roger Bannister breaking a barrier that none of us as runners, I was in the late 50s, so I was right part of that, where we thought this was an impossible, absolutely impossible mountain to climb. And the Rebbe said, all of you runners were talked out of this nourish kite that you can't break a four minute mile on, on a run. And I'll tell you, it made such an impact on me, and especially since running and bicycle riding and all kinds of things requiring the leg, are things that part of my life, all my life, even to now in my very old age. And I'll tell you, the, the experiences corroborate what, what you said, Rabbi Gronberg, and answer your question, Rabbi Hecht, in saying that we can certainly use optimistic stances in these examples of how you can improve health. Every one of us in the room here will probably have to face some kind of idea like this in the course of our lives. And if it's not with us personally, it might be in the course of our parents' lives or our relatives' lives where we can actually make a very positive impact medically. And I'll just go back now to what I said before that I would talk about 102 years ago and you say, well, what? how could you bring that into the conversation? Well, you must remember that 102 years ago, the Rebbe was just becoming a 16-year-old. And what was happening when he was turning 16? It was the year 1918. 
102 years ago. And the Rebbe was living in Europe. Now, they didn't have radio. Radio was not on the, not in the public domain until the 1920s. This was 1918. And he was in Europe, which they didn't have rapid transportation of newspapers that were printed in one city and brought to another city. And communication was much, much, much more laborious and slow. So without anyone informing the Rebbe, he was seeing right in his own city that people were, were unfortunately, there was something prevailing upon them that reminded everyone of the Black Plague of, Plague of Europe of the Middle Ages. And people were dying left and right. And the Rebbe saw himself and everyone around him as if they might be like trees in a forest that's on fire, where the only advantage is that he's not a tree. He can move out of the forest, not stay in the forest, and the tree is stuck in a burning forest and inescapably might get singed or burned altogether. The Rebbe told his father that he would prefer if he kept his mother and father and himself in his own domain, in the house where he lived, and studied with his very learned father, and took himself out of a populated yeshiva and, and explained this to his friends, asking if they could think like he did. Very, very few people did think like he did, and he spared himself the widespread devastation of, of the um, of the uh, epidemic, which was an influenza A epidemic, not, not a COVID, COVID um, coronavirus type of epidemic now, but it had the same effect, very high death rate, very high spread potential, and really no public information that was being applied properly or even known in those days of what to do properly. After several months of seeing that several of his friends and their families were getting very sick, he decided to leave the household to try to help them, as would be in the Rebbe's heart to do. He himself got very sick and was in a delirium from having gotten sick with the virus, but he didn't obviously succumb, thank God. And he learned that you can only go so far with how far you can help people. I wrote a little story at Sudas Moshiach, where we had a Sudas Moshiach where we presented the written copy of our talks on the past Pesach. And I presented this story to our Chabad group in Skokie, Illinois, where we live. And they were very taken by how the Reb approached he, the Rebbe recognized the need to take affirmative action and wise policy. I only wish that I had had the wisdom to publish this article widely because I think Chabad in 770 was hit very hard by this epidemic by not using the Rebbe's wisdom because they didn't know about what the Rebbe had done. They didn't realize the Rebbe immediately caught on to the idea that you have to really take great protection, protect yourself against the spreading flames of an epidemic. And, um, but it was really an important lesson in life. I myself, my name is Yitzchak, my Hebrew name is Yitzchak, and I'm named after a grandfather who died at age 32 in 1918. And he was a tailor in Chicago, and he was handling clothing of people. Thousands of people were bringing their repairs and stuff, and very few people washed their clothes properly when they handed it over and dumped, them, dumped it in his house to take care of. So probably through the contamination of the clothing, he, he died at age 32, which was not an uncommon event in my mother and my aunt were left as little babies with my dear grandmother as a widow. But they, my grandmother survived to 100. She, she was very optimistic. And she, with all that she had set up with no money, no education, no language skills, no writing skills, and two little daughters, she raised them beautifully and lived to 100. And the Rebbe was very taken by the story of how she used her optimism to surmount something that was so adverse, where she had no relatives in Chicago. She was brought here as a servant, a household servant, had these two little girls and no language skills illiterate and yet earned a living and kept them alive and well and she they became very upright members of of the jewish community here in chicago but i really want to thank you Rebbe greenberg because you really hit the right notes on that talk and you touched upon the Rebbe very importantly and Rebbe hecht you wisely engineered a question that tied us right all three of us together and i want to thank all of you for coming to honor the Rebbe's the memory of the Rebbe. and he's not a memory he's actively part of our lives in every way any one of you who really gets involved with chabad will recognize how much the Rebbe will deliver to you on your doorstep every minute, every day. From the time you say, Modani, Lefanecha, and even say, Bechemla, you know, with mercy God gives us, you know, we don't even deserve necessarily to be given this reprieve on life every single day. But Bechemla is a word that I like to emphasize of that, Modani, just to expand a little bit on what you said, Rabbi Greenberg. <laughs> but my, my, my assurance to you is that this is a Rebbe who is unlike any previous Rebbe, and he has left an imprint on this world and will always leave an imprint on this world of the most positive type. And we're, we're going to survive anything that hits us because we had the Lubavitcher Rebbe guide us. 
and I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to blab on right now. <laughs> I know you're all very tired. Thank it's you. Thank you so much, wow. Dr. Weiss. I'm going to just ask Rabbi Greenberg to give us a two-minute closing. Thank you, everyone. Uh, the best possible closing is uh, to end with the moving and beautiful and firsthand stories and reflections of, of Dr. Weiss that was so precious and special and real and powerful. And we'll leave it right where I There's nothing that can be added that summed up every, uh, how beautiful. Thank you. Unbelievable. Surely you just, I'm not a good speaker, but I love the way you spoke to us. <laughs> Thank all right. Thank you, everyone. We really appreciate you all coming on behalf of all the Chabad centers here in JLI Chicago. Have a great night. And don't forget this Wednesday night and Thursday is the Rebbe's Yard site. Make it a special and meaningful day. A good Chodesh. Good Chodesh. Thank you, Dr. Weiss. Good <laughs> <Reflect> for you. <laughs> Bye-bye.